Welcome everybody and thank you all of the audience around the world for participating in this session. Congratulations to the GLF team for organizing such an important event and to the GIZ team to lead the design of this session. A quick announcement that uh, there is simultaneous translation in English, Spanish and French available. And for that, you will need to download an app, interactual.io. I think uh, somebody is posting it on the chat at the moment. Um, and you have to enter the event code. Um, in this session, we will switch between Spanish and English. My name is Adriana Vidal, Senior Forest Policy Officer at IUCN, and I am delighted to moderate this dialogue. Uh, let me start with some brief remarks to frame the topic. The Global Biodiversity Outlook 5 recently confirmed the extent of which none of the Aichi biodiversity targets have been completely achieved the urgency of acting upon the current climate and biodiversity crisis has been never so extreme. Looking forward, there are key things to learn and priorities to change in order to successfully achieve the next set of goals and targets currently under development under, under the post 2020 biodiversity framework. Financing mechanisms will be needed for investment in biodiversity in the same way that mainstream finance drives the rest of the economy. Promising trends towards sustainable finance, impact investment, and responsible consumption and production must be scaled up and expanded. So they go from niche activities to make a transformational impact. Financial institutions are showing a growing commitment for the conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity, such as the latest Finance for Biodiversity Pledge announced by 26 financial institutions during the Biodiversity Summit at the UN General Assembly in September. Financial institutions are also starting to integrate biodiversity aspects into their products by taking greater account of biodiversity criteria in investment decisions and lending. In addition, they are also starting to specifically promote companies that operate in biodiversity friendly manners and offer investment products with a positive impact on biodiversity. Uh, the COVID-19 crisis radically changed the setting for mainstreaming biodiversity into the finance sector. There is a risk that the challenges faced by economies and societies as they recover from COVID-19 will lead to reduced attention and spending towards biodiversity. However, there is also a worldwide call for transforming our societies and economies through green recovery. And there, is, there are positive examples of governments that are committed to building forward better. With a One Health approach, COVID-19 has brought attention to the linkages between biodiversity, health, and human well-being. For a sustainable recovery, it is crucial to mainstream biodiversity into the financial sector and to link COVID-19 response measures to financial incentives for a biodiversity sustainable future. The objective of this session is to discuss promising trends in sustainable finance that promotes biodiversity and to reflect on ways of strengthening finance. We will focus on how we can integrate these measures into the recovery plans from COVID-19. For this, we have an excellent group of panelists representing the government, investors, banks, indigenous peoples and civil society. We organize them into two groups with different discussion topics. The first group will cover green recovery strategies and policies, while the second group will focus on approaches, experiences and instruments of sustainable finance. A quick run uh, through the session format. The first group of panelists will have two quick moderated question rounds. Then the second group of panelists 
will address a specific question related to the sector they represent. To make this as interactive as possible, there will be a couple of Slido or online questions to the audience in between these two groups of panelists. Afterwards, we have planned time to answer questions from the audience. Uh, please feel welcome to post all of your questions at any time in the question and answers function of the WUBA platform. Participants um, can see which are the most top popular topics um, uh, for this session. Now, let me introduce you to the first group of panelists. We have the pleasure of having Ms. Monique Akulo, Senior Internal Monitoring and Evaluation Officer at the National Environment Management Authority in Uganda. Mr. Humberto Delgado Rosa, Director for Natural Capital at the Director Directorate General for Environment of the European Commission. Dr. Mathur, Chairman at the National Biodiversity Authority, India. And Mr. Gabriel Quijandria Acosta, Vice Minister for Strategic Development of Natural Resources at the Ministry of Environment in Peru. So let's start with a discussion. Let me ask all of the panelists, the, to this group of, of panelists, this question. Let's say that you are sitting um, here in this session with your colleagues from the finance ministry and the office of the president or prime minister. How, what is the pitch you would um, deliver about the urgency of biodiversity mainstreaming in the financial sector? Um, we will start with with Mr. Uh, sorry, with Mrs. Akulo, um, please over to you. Thank you very much, Ms. Adriana Vidal, and I would like to thank the uh, Global Landscape Forum for inviting me to this wonderful global forum. Um, the question is very interesting, and I think I will pitch it with: um, We have competing priorities of government and we focus on more on service delivery. And then uh, that leads to uh, economic development, but also risk uh, environmental degradation in the short and long term. And the current uh, focus for Uganda, for instance, is infrastructure development. And uh, we know infrastructure development will lead to access to markets, increase services delivery, provide opportunities for value addition of agricultural production, and hence improving livelihood and leading to wealth creation and possible sustainable development of natural resources. And so, um, Mr. Prime Minister, I would request that you, we ensure that we prioritize uh, biodiversity because without our biodiversity being conserved, we lead a loss of a lot of financial money, but also leading to loss of um, uh, economic development and slowing down our uh, goals to improving livelihoods. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Akulo. Uh, now let's um, ask Mr. Uh, Delgado uh, from his perspective at the, Euro at the European Union. Uh, what are the, how would you address this issue um, in your in your geographic area. Thank you very much. Let me then address you as Prime Minister, Mrs. Prime Minister. Our economy and our society are at increasing risks of losing the, their foundations. Nature is degrading all around us and we are losing millions per year of economic value generation. For example, from less pollination with risks to agriculture production, less fisheries, less protection to floods, forest fires, extreme weather events, less tourism opportunities, increased health risks. And voters are noticing, you know, they want you to act on climate change as well as on biodiversity loss. One goes with the other, all increasing our social and economic risks. And protecting nature is popular in public opinion. So this must be addressed together, nature and climate change. So you need to put money on restoring nature services to people and the economy because it pays off. It pays off on jobs, including local jobs, 
on managing ecosystems, restoring natural capital, planting trees, greening our cities, etc. Economic opportunities for innovative businesses on uh, alternative approaches to food, to fiber, recreation, to greening the cities. And it also pays off in terms of recovery from the COVID crisis, not only building our resilience, but also shielding us from further and worse pandemics that have an, a nature in the, our mismanagement of nature. So some will come to you and tell you that giving more space to nature will hurt their sectors, their business, their economy. They are wrong. Many of them are based on unsustainable activities and running against the wall anyway. They don't even know how to measure their impacts and dependencies on nature. And actually, solutions are coming from nature also for business, nature-based solutions. So in some, we need to invest also in developing further natural capital accounting approaches, ways to account and measure the relationships between benefits from nature and the economy at all levels, business, financial institutions, country level, and taking that into account in decision-making. To end up in Europe, this is pretty much the message of the European Green Deal we have on the table. Thank you and back to you. Many thanks, uh, Mr. Delgado. You have provided a, a quite a comprehensive uh, overview of the different arguments that support investment in biodiversity, not only um, for the importance of biodiversity itself, but in connection with the, the economy um, and many other arguments. Now let me uh, move to uh, switch to Mr. Uh, Dr. Mathur. Um, Dr. Mathur, we're very interested in uh, listening from the perspective um, from a country like India, which, who, which is um, very vast, very big, uh, with so much um, biodiversity and natural resources. What would you, uh, what, which arguments would you use um, if you were um, at the finance ministry or at the prime, prime minister office? Please go ahead. So thank you very much for providing me an opportunity. And I would say that it is not very often that a biodiversity professional is provided an opportunity to interact with the wizards of the finance ministry and that of the prime minister's office. So surely something interesting must be happening, which has made this interaction and this dialogue possible. And uh, I would like to share that uh, India as a part of the UNDP-led biodiversity finance initiative has recently conducted an expenditure, a biodiversity finance expenditure review. We have for the first time prepared a biodiversity finance plan. So we are now in a position to know that how much the country is spending on biodiversity conservation, what is our requirement, and more importantly, what is the gap in funding? So we now have a much better idea. And we have done these calculations and a whopping figure of about 6.5 billion US dollars annually is what we need as a funding gap. So now this gap cannot be met by the Ministry of Environment Forest alone. And that is where we want to reach out to the finance ministry and to the officials uh, because the sustainable development goals, these goals cannot be met if we do not invest in biodiversity conservation. So that is the first uh, point I want to make that uh, we need to move towards uh, biodiversity friendly or positive infrastructure. And secondly, I want to draw an attention to a very interesting report to the knowledge of our guys from the finance ministry that uh, this report is called as bankrolling extinction report. And very interestingly, it is saying that uh, the 50 top banks of the world, these banks are giving capital amounting to something like 2.6 trillion US dollars, which is being used to, for uh, activities which go against uh, biodiversity conservation, which go against forestry, which go against agriculture. So see, this is where we need to have a wake up call. And I would like to urge our colleagues that uh, when it comes to uh, reforming the financial institutions, we need to see that in which direction 
our banks are moving because if they continue to fund a uh, disaster then obviously we will be in a very bad shape and that is where we need to urge that at the top level of political leadership we need to look at uh, how these investments are made and uh, the perverse subsidies in agriculture which are causing a huge amount of uh, damage to nature conservation see these figures are something like 450 billion us dollar annually so these are whopping figures and we need to have a change in mindset and a change in direction and which is what this interaction is likely to lead to so that would be my plea at this point of time that we need to look at uh, the direction in which the financial institutions are moving we need to look at uh, the public finance because public finance is the one which provides the maximum amount of money to all the federal ministries so that expenditure needs to be looked and has to be aligned or realigned to support biodiversity conservation so that would be my message to my colleagues uh, in the pm office and in the finance ministry that this uh, relook and revisit of these policies and institutional reforms are needed to bring in any transformative change that we want to bring in in biodiversity conservation so thank you very much for providing me this opportunity thank you very much uh, dr mathur you have raised very important points uh, that go um, beyond the importance of biodiversity but we what we are uh, what are the steps and actions that countries are taking um, to really put this in, into into practice the investments the uh, government decisions to promote in, um, investments being private and public so um, we're going to come back to this topic because it is really instrumental um, now please let me ask uh, vice minister uh, kihandria um, and for this, I'm going to switch to Spanish. Um, Viceministro Quijandría, um, hemos estado hablando acerca de cuáles serían los argumentos fuerza para poder um, vender, si usted, si usted quiere llamarlo así, eh, la, la urgencia de invertir en biodiversidad um, a, a tomadores de decisiones en En, en sectores en los sectores financieros en, en otros en la oficina la presidencia del consejo de ministros etcétera usted estando en la posición en la que se encuentra qué nos podría decir que, que son a qué estos argumentos fuerza especialmente en el contexto donde nos encontramos muchas gracias Adriana y muchas gracias a, a G y Z por la por la invitación para ser parte de este de este panel y poder compartir algunas reflexiones sobre este tema tan importante. Y, y gracias por ponernos además en una situación que es básicamente el pan de cada día. Es la lucha de los ministerios del ambiente por generar esta comprensión acerca de, de la necesidad de entender a la diversidad biológica, a los ecosistemas y a las contribuciones que estos ecosistemas generan como un bien público. Por tanto, como algo tan importante como la educación, como la seguridad ciudadana, como la salud. ¿No? O sea, tiene que ser un, eh, reconocido como un objeto, en primera instancia, como un objeto de inversión pública, con un objeto que merece recibir atención de parte de las políticas públicas y, por tanto, re merece recibir presupuesto y merece recibir una intervención especial, sobre todo en un contexto como el actual, marcado pues, por una pandemia originada por una zoonosis originada a su vez por un manejo inadecuado de ecosistemas, una interacción eh, exagerada entre fauna silvestre y las, y las personas que, que, que deberíamos, deberíamos evitar. Creo que la argumentación tiene que ir por ese lado y la argumentación debería ir por el lado de, 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 de ir demostrando con, con, datos, con datos claros cómo la inversión eh, sensible a los temas ambientales sensible a los temas de, de generación de resiliencia, de, de, de reducción de la, de la afectación de ecosistemas, de, de, de mitigación de emisiones de gases de efecto invernadero, es una inversión igualmente competitiva o incluso más competitiva que la, que la inversión tradicional. Como este, 
demostrar, por ejemplo, lo que, lo que en el 2017 se pudo hacer aquí en Perú, mostrar que, los, que el, el turismo de áreas protegidas genera cerca de 800 millones de dólares de ingresos al año y cerca de 40 mil empleos directos. Este, y, y por tanto, lo, lo, lo que se demuestra ahí es que las áreas protegidas no son tierra ociosa, no son tierra improductiva, son tierra que está generando un beneficio, está generando un beneficio además que llega al bolsillo de personas que están en zonas remotas, en las cuales el Estado tiene muy poca presencia, donde los otros programas sociales llegan tarde, mal y nunca. Entonces, hay eh, ahí una transferencia directa de beneficio a la, a la población este, que, es, que está más necesitada, justamente la población que nosotros los funcionarios públicos tenemos el mandato de atender en, en, en prioridad. Y si esa argumentación no es suficiente, yo añadiría, tal vez, esta, esta no la hemos probado mucho todavía, el tema de decir, bueno, ¿cuántos años crees que le quedan de vida y de capacidad de pago de sus préstamos a un productor de café que, que produce de manera insostenible? Yo creo que bien pocos, ¿no? Porque, porque en muchos casos ya los mercados internacionales no reciben café producido de manera insostenible o cacao producido de manera insostenible. Cada vez más la exigencia de bird friendly, y ecosystem friendly y, y, y redu reducido en emisiones y, 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 y comercio justo se convierten en la norma. Y no solamente a nivel internacional, sino a nivel local, porque estamos en un mundo absolutamente interconectado, donde estas sensibilidades... Por, por el consumo bajo, con, con bajo impacto, son cada vez más, este, están cada vez más difundidas. Entonces, yo creo que, o sea, ¿cuánto le queda a ese productor que lo hace de manera irresponsable para poder seguir pagando su préstamo? Entonces, es un tema de supervivencia de la, de, 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 de la, del, del sistema financiero en el largo plazo. Gracias. Muchas gracias, eh, viceministro. Efectivamente, usted toca... Eh, temas bastante prácticos que realmente resuenan con mucha gente que no necesariamente trabaja eh, con la etiqueta de biodiversidad al frente, pero conecta muy de cerca eh, eh, los usos de la biodiversidad y el impacto que genera para sus actividades productivas y su sostenibilidad. Y creo, efectivamente, concuerdo eh, con usted eh, en el sentido que estos son argumentos bastante eh, poderosos. Um, now, let me move to the second uh, round of questions for this group of panelists, um, which is very much connected to what we are um, speaking right now. Um, but framing it more specifically into what we are seeing now, Countries around the globe, um, around the globe are um, already uh, rolling out their recovery plans, their economic recovery plans with a set of measures uh, and plans across different sectors. Um, more often than not, we see that these economic recovery plans don't necessarily um, mainstream um, investment for biodiversity or um, as a way of um, paving the way for this economic recovery. So let me ask you to, to all of you, um, what, um, what do you think could be the entry points or possible instruments to integrate biodiversity conservation and sustainable use in your country or region um, in your rec recovery plans, in your COVID recovery plans? Um, let's start with uh, in the same order as before. So, uh, Mrs. Akulo, um, you have the floor. Yes, thank you, Adriana, um, for the question. Um, one of the reasons why we should uh, consider COVID-19 as a radical uh, issue is scaling up the approaches. Uh, especially mainstreaming. We have ongoing mainstreaming by many governments and mainstreaming by diversity in all sectors will provide innovative financing to scale up current domestic and international financing. We also see innovating green financing domestically uh, where Africa needs to focus on the natural-based solutions because it's rich with its natural resources. 
and we see uh, diverse uh, biodiversity in Eastern and sub South Sub-Saharan region, rich with a lot of biodiversity, and hence the need to have um, mechanisms like uh, payment for ecosystem services, scaling up uh, utilization of trust funds, which are all over the, 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 the continent. And then also we have the stewardship among uh, individuals that needs to be supported. We also need to support ecological physical transfers to support local governments and cities in resource mobilization. But we also see that there is a strong need to have uh, stakeholder engagement, which is continuous communication, especially with the private sector support led initiatives, such as the joint partnership ventures, the um, three Ps, the public private partnerships. Uh, this will work well, especially in the tourism sector and the agriculture sector and the health sector to address the issues that we see now that COVID has brought out. And then also it will provide basic sanitation uh, services, clean water for the communities. And then the audience also, we need to dialogue with groups of people like the IPLCs who are very vulnerable to COVID now. And then the media that will help us communicate this continuously to make people aware about it. The farmers, local leaders, all this will support the shift of um, financing towards biodiversity friendly approaches for the future so that we have everybody inclusive and leave no one behind. And then finally, the governance. Governance is what crowns it all in handling COVID and post COVID. We see it's, it should be anchored in all efforts. The political will of government will provide safeguards in any COVID strategy that is placed in any institution or um, in the continent. So governance and leadership will provide positive benefits in achieving all efforts, but also putting measures in place. I thank you. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Sakulo. Um, definitely you have pointed out to, to many, many different um, examples of instruments that um, I mean, financial and also uh, tied with policy and governance enabling conditions. Um, now I would like to ask the same question to Mr. Delgado. Um, what are the, the I mean, let me repeat the question, but framing it a little bit different for, for you. Um, these entry points of possible instruments to integrate biodiversity, conservation and sustainable use in, in Europe's uh, recovery plans. I, I know that um, Europe is not a starting from Zero in the sense that there has there are there have been existent instruments already uh, ongoing before the pandemic. So, how would be um, what would be the continuation, I guess, of, of these efforts um, for the future? Thank you, Adriana, for the question. Let me start by first uh, an intro comment, which is. We have now in the EU approved the EU biodiversity strategy for 2030, which actually I think is a really ambitious strategy that I'm pleased to have seen come out. When was it approved? Well, it was approved in May. That was amidst the pandemics. We had a bit, a couple of months delay, yes, but on having this strategy come out, and by the way, at the same time, with the, strat the, the strategy for the sustainable food system, what we call the farm to fork strategy, that signaled that the topic of biodiversity was not unrelated to the pandemics, the, the first point. Uh, and the people have mm, gained in Europe more perception that actually these pandemics, as other zoonotic diseases in the past, came from mismanagement of nature from us as humans encroaching into ecosystems, reducing wildlife insects to a point that diseases that should not reach us are getting to us. Now, of course, when with this enormous crisis brought in by COVID, the minds of many will be on the recovery in the point of view of health measures, economy, wages, salaries, livelihoods, business, and not really on nature. But there are two, two elements of that. One is the, what I told you first, this idea which is well grounded now that if we want to avoid further pandemics and possibly even worse pandemics, we need to give more space to nature. And second, 
uh, at least those that were in urban settings can find for some months and, and stopping a lot of activities other than online, that also brought an idea of a frenzy of consumption, of movement, of, of the lack of quality of life. Now, when we listen to birds in cities instead of, of automobiles, that also brought to some, we need to build something different. So I would say this EU recovery and resilience plan, which will bring massive flows of money to the member states for the recovery, well, the biodiversity strategy is actually a fundamental element of that, explicitly mentioned, and biodiversity is embedded in the guidance of the European Commission to the member states for their recovery and resilience plans. So I think this element of bringing in a resilient recovery, also from the point of the economy, instead of just bringing back unsustainable practices, added to this uh, close link between climate finance and biodiversity finance, in the sense that many initiatives in favor of climate mitigation and adaptation are also in favor of nature or benefit, benefiting from nature and its services. Plus, finally, this idea of the economic opportunities that I've already, already referred, that a green recovery can bring local jobs in organic farming, agroecological approaches, green infrastructure, including in cities, rewetting wetlands, planting trees, restoring free-flowing rivers, bringing nature-based solutions to buildings, the managing better protected areas. All this derives from the biodiversity strategy and there's a real sense of economy and jobs also. And finally, maybe not less important, we do have the provisions on do no harm um, within the Green Deal. So we will be watchdogs as European Commission so that the projects coming from recovery will not bring damage to the environment, biodiversity included. So I'm, I am, let's say, relatively confident that this will also benefit nature and biodiversity. Uh, many thanks, uh, Mr. Delgado. Um, it is very interesting to, to hear um, that, as you mentioned, um, such an ambitious plan for uh, public investment in solutions that um, definitely will, will benefit um, um, the general, will create jobs, but uh, also are in direct relation with uh, nature, uh, green infrastructure, uh, and nature-based solutions, as, as you mentioned earlier. Um, so now let me ask uh, Dr. Mathor um, all the same question, but um, we are very interesting, interested in, in hearing from um, your perspective, uh, Dr. Mathor, uh, regarding, about, regarding the, the entry points or possible instruments uh, that could be used to integrate biodiversity into India's recovery plans? Uh, I would begin by saying that uh, the year 2020 is a year of double whammy. And why I say that is that when we came back from our Christmas and New Year vacations in early January, already there were reports that economy is slowing down and the year-on-year -year growth rates are going to be less and some even predicted they are going to be negative. So that itself was a bad news. And then as we moved along came the COVID. And with this COVID, the intensity of actions increased and uh, the country, the entire country of ours went under very severe lockdown. The lockdown meant uh, lack of business, lack of opportunities, so uh, the economy got further beating, if I can say that. And uh, we were in a very, very bad situation. And now, globally, and India included, the story of economic uh, recovery packages started. Everybody started talking of economic stimulus. And so did India. And there were countries like Brazil and South Africa, which started uh, making these uh, economic stimulus package to what they, we call it as a kickstarting of economy. The economy which had come to a grinding halt had to start. So we in India also prepared uh, our plans and we looked at our public finance scheme. And that is where I want to share with the, with the audience today 
that we have an employment guarantee scheme which provides uh, employment and livelihood to a large number of our rural population. And what COVID did, there was a reverse migration. People from cities, from towns, from urban areas started moving back to the villages. So there was a huge issue of uh, food security on one hand and getting employment on the other. So what the government did in our economic stimulus package, the component of uh, agriculture, and when I say agriculture, I'm talking of regenerative agriculture. I'm talking of forestry uh, leading to plantation of medicinal plants, which have economic value. So what we did, we started tweaking our big scheme and uh, increased their allocations. And these allocations uh, did two things. They provided employment to people. They provided uh, an importance for biodiversity conservation. And that is where the forestry, the agroforestry and the biodiversity component in these schemes, it increased. So it is now giving us rich dividends that we are conserving our nature. And we are also looking at uh, providing employment on one side and raising uh, the agriculture productivity, which is very, very important for a country like ours, because we can't allow our people uh, to remain hungry. So this uh, is the nature of the economic stimulus package. And we wish that the government continues with that package and uh, makes uh, additional allocations so that uh, the contribution of forestry, biodiversity, and agriculture sector enhances. And it creates a kind of a mindset amongst people that biodiversity conservation has a positive effect and can make a very valuable contribution. So this is what uh, our, our ideas are. And uh, there are proven examples that uh, if you tweak uh, these uh, schemes, which were made for a different purpose, but in response of COVID, they have been now made biodiversity friendly. And this is the biggest learning for India that uh, there will be no separate money allocated for biodiversity conservation. But in the existing public finance scheme, if we can increase the element of biodiversity mainstreaming, it will go a long way and it will be creating a win-win situation. So that is what is the India story in, uh, as we try to deal with the COVID-19 and related to uh, biodiversity conservation efforts. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mathur. Um, very interested indeed to, to hear from, from this um, change of, of um, I mean, not change of a strategy, but mainstreaming biodiversity in the existing solutions. And um, it is also inter interesting to hear that um, ac productive activities that represent a huge um, part of the economic sector, such as agriculture, are, um, have a different take now um, that with biodiversity. Um, mainstream. So thank you for sharing that. Um, ahora eh, quisiera darle la, la palabra al viceministro eh, Quijandría para que pueda por favor eh, compartir sus, eh, la, la información que viene de Perú respecto de, estos, eh, de este tema. Por favor, adelante. Muchas, muchas gracias, Adriana, por la palabra nuevamente. Voy a, voy a tomar este parte de lo que estaba señalando Humberto en, en, en sus dos presentaciones, ¿no? en sus dos intervenciones previas. ¿no? Este, este problema del COVID nos ha puesto claramente frente al, a, a esta, esta realidad de, 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 de darnos cuenta de que no le hemos dejado suficiente espacio a la naturaleza para poder realizar sus, sus actividades, poder llevar adelante sus, su, sus procesos. Y, y, y hemos ocupado todo el espacio, ¿no? Y, y, y cómo necesitamos poder replantear este, nuestra mirada a la naturaleza, dejar de considerarla un rival, dejar de considerarla algo que tenemos que someter y convertirla en parte del, del paquete de soluciones para cerrar brechas de desarrollo, para cerrar o para resolver problemas ambientales que nosotros mismos hemos generado en 
o sea, a partir de esta relación disfuncional que hemos tenido con la naturaleza. Y creo que, o sea, poder desplegar este, es, esto que se llaman ahora las, las soluciones basadas en la naturaleza o el enfoque, digamos, de soluciones basadas en la naturaleza es eh, la, la apuesta verdadera y la apuesta sostenible en el, en el largo plazo. ¿Cómo, ¿Cómo estructuramos eso? A través de poder incluir eh, esta, esta mirada o este enfoque de, 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 de soluciones basadas en la naturaleza en, en, en varios aspectos, eh, cosas que se estaban discutiendo, por ejemplo, en, en, eh, un poco antes de que, de que nos llegara la pandemia, ¿no? En el caso peruano, por ejemplo, el Plan Nacional de, de, de Competitividad, ¿no? Y, y de promoción de la competitividad, donde habíamos logrado incluir algunos temas importantes vinculados, por ejemplo, a la emisión de bonos verdes para financiar intervenciones o temas en, 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 la, en la agenda ambiental, el, el impulso de, 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 lo que es, de la utilización, por ejemplo, de instrumentos como las obras por impuestos para, orientadas, por ejemplo, que, es, que han sido muy exitosas, por ejemplo, para construir escuelas, para construir costas de salud, pero orientarlas, por ejemplo, a recuperación de ecosistemas en la zona altoandina, por ejemplo, que tienen un impacto muy directo en calidad y cantidad de agua, sobre todo en un ámbito que está afectado pues, por el retroceso rápido de glaciares en los últimos años, ¿no? Como efecto del cambio climático. Entonces, ¿cómo hacemos para lograr que esto que ya estaba planteado y puesto por escrito pero que no se estaba moviendo a la velocidad necesaria, este, pueda agarrar un, un, una nueva dinámica, ¿no? O sea, pueda convertirse ahora que, que estamos teniendo posibilidad de salir de la caja y de pensar cosas o de plantear cosas que antes no se habían planteado, como subsidios o como, o, o como salvataje de empresas, se plantee también en términos de cómo enverdecemos la cartera, cómo enverdecemos la intervención, cómo promovemos nuevos modelos de negocio, modelos de negocio, por ejemplo, para el ámbito amazónico, que sean menos dependientes de la materialidad, que necesiten menos carreteras, que, que estén más vinculados, por ejemplo, a transacciones financieras este, de, 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 de Internet, que, neces, o sea, que, que, que requieren más este, banda ancha de Internet que una gran carretera que conecta eh, pedazos de selva o zonas de jungla y que tienen un riesgo inmenso pues por la deforestación que se puede generar por, por ellas. Entonces, ¿cómo hacemos para hacer que estas actividades sean las, las que se elijan dentro del paquete de, de, de reactivación antes que, que aquellas que no tienen un, un componente ambiental asociado, ¿no? ¿Cómo, cómo establecemos este, fideicomisos, por ejemplo, específicos para la gestión de áreas protegidas o para la promoción y el financiamiento de actividades este, que, que, por ejemplo, están siendo ya buscadas por el sector privado, pero que tienen todavía un nivel de riesgo alto porque son, o sea, está uno explorando este, tierra, tierra poco conocida, ¿no? O sea, necesita trabajo con comunidades, por ejemplo, con comunidades locales. Entonces, ¿cómo hacemos nosotros desde el Estado para entrar también y cofinanciar esas intervenciones, cosa que asumamos parte de ese riesgo que, de, que, 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 que se requiere para que el sector privado entre eh, de, manera, de manera fuerte, ¿no? Y logremos además, eh, creo que dar el siguiente paso de lo que señalaba Humberto, porque yo creo que las, las finanzas con apellido, las finanzas de diversidad biológica, las finanzas climáticas no alcanzan. Lo que yo necesito es transversalizar esa mirada eh, en todos los flujos financieros para que realmente la tendencia cambie. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, viceministro. Eh, usted nos recuerda que... Eh, la innovación es un elemento crítico para poder eh, modificar la, las inversiones tradicionales que, que se conocen. Eh, la, pro, la promoción de la protección de la biodiversidad no solamente se resume a áreas protegidas, por ejemplo, sino va a lo largo de los sectores, a través de los sectores económicos. Eso es algo interesante que, que se tiene que tener en cuenta. Um, I would like to take a pause on the round of questions to get um, the pulse of uh, the audience's views. Uh, for this, as mentioned before, we will use the Slido tool. Um, please go to your browsers and open slido.com and enter the code that hopefully you all see on your screens. Um, and once you enter the code or uh, scan the QR code, you will be able to see the couple of questions that we have ready for you. 
Um, so the first question, um, if you all already access the Slido uh, survey, is this, um, it's, ver it's very simple, a question with two, two options, I agree or disagree. The question is, the topic of biodiversity receives more attention due to the current COVID-19 crisis and measures for recovery. So please let us know uh, whether you agree or disagree with this um, statement. Uh, we will give you 30 seconds to, to fill out the question, the question, the answer, sorry. Um, let me set up my timer, hopefully. We'll have um, as many uh, members of the audience as possible filling out this question and letting us know what, what you think. Um, I, I see that the number on the right is going up. So I am hoping that means that people are actually filling out the, the poll. Um, so thank you for that. Um, actually, this, this question is, is pretty, pretty relevant because um, in our fields, we all understand the importance of biodiversity, of addressing biodiversity, the biodiversity crisis, especially in this context. But um, it is interesting to see what do you think is happening out there in the world, in the uh, wider world, in other sectors and so on. Um, we are reaching the, the 60 second timer. So if um, the team can show us the results. All right. I see that uh, most people agree with this statement. Um, I think it, it is very, it's very hopeful to hear that you in your, in your fields of work, in your um, sectors, whatever you are working from, I assume um, many, it's a, a very wide mix of academia, economic sector, government, um, even people from civil society, um, they see that um, biodiversity receives uh, higher attention. And I'm sure that everybody has a role to play in, in this uh, transformation. So um, let's go to the second question, please. Um, the qu second question is, what are the main barriers for mainstreaming biodiversity in the financial sector? Uh, for this question, you are free to type any word you, you want, any word you think of. Um, try to type one word, maximum a couple of words, because what we are going to see afterwards is a word cloud with, um, with the words or the ideas that, you, that people have put more frequently um, or have mentioned more fre frequently in your answers. So, let me start the timer again. I know that there is a little bit of a delay. Um, so, okay, let's start now. Again, the question is, what are the main barriers for mainstreaming biodiversity in the financial sector? And by the way, we are referring to both public finance and private finance. So uh, based on your experience, knowledge, impressions, what do you think those main barriers are? Um, oh, great. So it's, I, I wasn't sure whether we were able to see the word cloud as people were answering, but um, I'm, I'm happy to see that this is um, working this way. I see a huge, um, the, the biggest word is mindset. And uh, as, question, as answers come up, let's see how it changes. Politics, uncertainty. I assume uncertainty in investments. Uh, right, I, um, I, I'm, I'm also assuming that policies and politics um, refer to, well, it could refer to two different things actually. Perverse incentives, that is actually one of the things and our panelists were discussing about the, the importance of looking at current subsidies and programs and, and really changing, transforming the perspectives for a more biodiversity friendly um, investment. 
yes, a panelist rightfully says it's the same and different regions. Um, all right, so what can we do to change this mindset? What can we do um, to change the, the politics from our own corner? Um, that is a question that I, I leave to all of you. All right, um, let's close the poll for now. Thank you very much for um, participating. Um, now, um, let's move on to the second part of the event. Um, we, here we will discuss approaches, experiences, and instruments to scale up finance and incentives for investment on biodiversity. Um, a quick introduction of our panelists. First, we have uh, Mr. Rodrigo de la Cruz, Technical Advisor to the Indigenous Forum of Aiba Yala and International Indigenous Forum on Biodiversity, representing indigenous peoples within the process of the Convention on Biological Diversity. Then we have Mrs. Maureen Erasmus, Advisor and Non-Executive Director on several boards in the financial services sector, Mr. Sasha Mueller Krenner, Executive Director of the NGO Environmental Action Germany, and Mr. Hugo Bertel, Program Development Manager um, of Sustainable Food at EVOS, uh, which is a development organization with global operations and headquarters in the Netherlands. Many thanks to our panelists for joining us today. So, um, comencemos con Rodrigo. Um, Rodrigo, una de las conclusiones del uh, Global Landscapes Forum realizado en Luxemburgo en 2019, eh, y esta, esta eh, referencia es bastante específica porque ese evento se enfocó en finanzas, fue que existe una tendencia hacia los productos financieros que fomentan la protección y uso sostenible de la biodiversidad, que buscan contribuir con los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible. Eh, ¿Qué opinión merece esta tendencia a los pueblos indígenas? ¿Y cuáles son sus expectativas para el futuro? Por favor, Rodrigo. Bueno, eh, muchas gracias por, por el espacio eh, que se ha generado con la, con la Feliceta y bueno, y otros organismos también como la UCM para tratar estos temas. Eh, efectivamente, eh, la necesidad de la, de la inversión eh, en territorio eh, con recursos financieros que puedan... Eh, dar un, un soporte a las actividades tradicionales de los pueblos indígenas, que esta, esta no es nueva. Los pueblos indígenas mismos han, han realizado ya eh, un, un sinnúmero de planteamientos en función de que eh, y, y la cooperación internacional I don't know if it's just me, but um, Rodrigo is oh, Entonces, eh, eh, esta, este planteamiento que, que se ha hecho desde los pueblos indígenas eh, no, no es nuevo, eh, es más bien un llamado para que efectivamente exista ese esfuerzo conjunto coordinado con las organizaciones de pueblos indígenas ¿no? Eh, y que, eh, que tenga muy presente el aporte de los saberes y conocimientos tradicionales de las, de las comunidades y de, los, de las comunidades indígenas y de los pueblos, de los pueblos locales. Muchas gracias, eh, Rodrigo, por, por la respuesta. Eh, es, como tú dices, esencial eh, con, no, poner a, a pueblos indígenas en el centro de estas soluciones y estas inversiones. Um, now, let me please uh, switch to Hugo. 
Um, Hugo, uh, Evos has a long-term experience with blended finance, uh, blended finance funds for sustainable food systems through the Evos uh, Triodos Fund. What are the lessons learned, especially regarding biodiversity? Um, and what would be needed, according uh, to your experience, to scale up efforts like um, similar to your to Evos? Thank you so much for uh, your for your question, and uh, we highly appreciate the opportunity to uh, to contribute to this session and uh, to attract more fu funding and finance for for biodiversity. Uh, first of all, I would like to to mention that uh, uh, Triodos Bank and Hifos Triodos Fund, um, which is a joint investment fund, uh, we have signed recently in September the uh, biodiversity pledge. And as, so, and as such, we are very uh, keen and happy to, uh, to be here and to be present here. Um, regarding the lessons learned, I would like to mention three, uh, three lessons, important lessons. The first one being that um, the Evos Triodos Fund is a fund uh, which already exists uh, more than 25 years. And um, we started uh, 25 years with a, a small fund of 10 million euros. And over the past 25 years, it has grown to a fund of over a billion euros. So, um, and how we uh, managed to, to, to uh, reach uh, this, this size is uh, through a combination of, uh, of blended finance. And so the, the second important um, uh, lesson is that through blended finance, we can bring uh, investments in small, medium scale enterprises to what we call higher risk areas. Uh, and higher risk areas, that is, that is important. It can be either uh, in, risk, in, in riskier environments. Uh, imagine an, an impact investor in uh, West Africa, Mali uh, versus, uh, versus, uh, uh, versus Europe. So if you want to bring capital to uh, an investments in biodiversity in higher risk areas, um, through blended finance, you can reduce the risk of, uh, of, of, of capital. How, how we, we can do that is either uh, through uh, capacity development, technical assistance to, uh, to companies, but also through policies. And so we have seen uh, policies and, and like in Europe, um, there's the Green Deal and the EU supporting through the Green Deal. But at the same time, we also see subsidies in the agricultural area. Uh, and so, um, uh, and by creating a, a level playing field, uh, we, we can uh, support the emergence of a, pri a private sector that uh, favors uh, biodiversity. The third important uh, lesson is on biodiversity itself. Uh, over the past 25 years, we have uh, seen and we have developed a, a viable investment fund investing in small and medium scale enterprises at that source from organic agriculture through agroecological approaches and as such uh, creating more diversity both in the field but also on the on the plate uh, may, maybe a final comment on on scaling um, i recall the uh, austrian uh, economist schumpeter on creative destruction sometimes we forget about it but creative destruction it is about reorganizing the economic order. And sometimes we have to say goodbye to the old in order to embrace what is new. The economic recovery packages, and we've seen the numbers flo uh, floating around uh, from Peru, from the EU, the size of these, from India, the size of these economic recovery uh, packages is enorm enormous. And uh, we would pledge that invest and use these economic recovery packages to invest in private sector that has biodiversity at its core. And, uh, and, and that's how we can step into the future and, and slowly uh, leave the past behind. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, um, Hugo. Um, you 
you are stressing out something very um, important, uh, which is that um, there are ways of de-risking investment in biodiversity. And um, there are collaborative approaches and other instruments that are available um, and, and are ready to be utilized in, in these um, new perspectives, new um, change that we need to bring about in the world. Um, thank you. Now, um, let me move to um, Maureen and to Maureen's question. Maureen, um, recently financial institutions um, have start, um, accelerated the, their interest in promoting the integration of biodiversity aspects in the financial sector. Um, what, what do you think is their motivation for this, um, for this trend to engage in, in biodiversity issues and the biodiversity agenda? Well, thank you very much, Adriana, and uh, good evening, good afternoon, and welcome, everyone. I thought it was fascinating before I respond to look at the word cloud and we saw a number of things that aren't particularly complementary of financial institutions and some with justification. But as I go through this, I will talk a bit about mindset. Uh, in truth, financial institutions were very late to the game in terms of being active intermediaries uh, on promoting biodiversity uh, through financing and capital raising. And we are, if I must be very honest, we are very nascent, uh, much though it is a heart and mind decision. I think uh, our heart is very much trying to understand and grapple with it as institutions, but the mind is always looking for the financial logic. However, this is changing and it's changing very rapidly. And it's changing not only through uh, what is coming out in the, the act, but through luminaries who are institutionally agnostic. So people like Mario Dragby, you know, head of the European Central Bank, Mark Carney, ex-governor of the Bank of England, and now he's the UN Special Envoy for Climate Action and the Paulson Institute, who's working alongside Cornell University and have just published a report in the last uh, uh, month that brings together the call to action for governments, for financial institutions. And these institutions and industry bodies very succinctly frame the link between biodiversity and being a financial intermediary. I think while it's very well understood that biodiversity is essential to preserving the ecosystems of the planet, the qualifications of the risk and financial impact have not been financially valued. And therefore, what tends to happen is it's acknowledged, but somewhat set aside and set aside that it's not formally embraced and measured through every action we do and we as financial institutions and measured. And so I think the biggest challenge and incentive for the adoption by financial institutions uh, is to frame biodiversity in financial terms. And I know this seems quite a blunt logic, but it's really important nature and biodiversity needs to be qualified as an asset. Um, so just as when we look at a financial portfolio in terms of risk and return, so too we must look at biodiversity in terms of how it reduces the risks and the portfolio within the natural assets. So we also need to place a much greater value in term, financial terms around biodiversity and sustainability. It's interesting in the Paulson report, they estimate and linking back to the World Economic Forum that nature provides about 44 trillion of the global GDP. That is 50, five zero percent of global GDP. And we tend to acknowledge that it's a good thing to do but when somebody says it's 50% relevant, 
at least, and they've put a financial number on it, which has financial basis. That's really important. I think with financial institutions, they need to step up to the plate, as does government, so both private and public sector, as you say. There's estimated, the Paulson Institute estimates that there's a financing gap of between 600 and 800 billion per annum that needs to be met to rebuild uh, and uh, our, our ecosystem as it stands. So to respond to your question, when you asked the motivation of financial institutions, it bo boils down to two things. One, to qualify the risk and the downside by continuing with status quo, and two, to quantify the potential revenue opportunities of proactive diversity risk management. And I think it comes through in terms of the incentive will come through from at least four perspectives. First of all, I think regulators will build in a number of aspects of what we have to think about in terms of financing, what we need to look at in terms of both the clients that we provide financing to and as well as the products. Two is financial institutions will need to retain clients. And so therefore they'll need to provide value added measures to incentivize biodiversity, for example, a loan to a farmer in Africa, India, or uh, Latin America, perhaps providing a discount if a farmer can dem demonstrate uh, sustainable farming practices. Financial institutions are notoriously competitive. So if uh, uh, others, and I think we really do need more bringing in by the US uh, banks, which are very global, the cities, the JP Morgans, etc., that go and HSBC that go ubiquitously across that sort of global footprint. Not only the regional, uh, big regional banks, but we need the minute they start doing demonstrable, interesting financial products. So there will be a following uh, around that because you will want to show that you're remaining competitive and pricing. There's a shareholder pressure and the uh, institutional activism. They're demanding increased and additional transparency on the customer profile to whom financial institutions are lending, as well as financing eco-regressive uh, projects such as gas pipelines that go across the wetlands. And I think there's also finally, uh, I hate to say this, but in terms of looking at numbers, which is good for us, the fee pools that are growing, so fee pools are, are active where you're going to generate returns and get returns from, is that green-based financing is the fastest growing fee pool uh, across any asset class and capital markets. And most of the asset classes are flat to declining. So there is, that is a uh, perhaps a self-incentive to retilt your financial institutions to become much more engaged in capital raising for green-based financing, blue ocean bonds, et cetera, and getting involved in everything around that. It's both a commercial imperative as well as the right thing to do. So I would also like to just close and say that biodiversity and sustainable financing should be ubiquitous across all finance and become very much mainstream, to which one of your speakers uh, did allude to uh, in, our earlier, um, in our earlier session. So I, I think in terms of you know, their motivation, their motivation will be multiple fold. It'll be some of it will be pressure from regulators, competitors, et cetera. But I think it needs to be much more mainstream and if we can uh, empirically, unfortunately, financial institutions are quite blunt instruments. They want to see numbers, fact-based logic. So we really do need a way of empirically uh, highlighting the risks, the costs, but also the returns by doing things well. Many thanks, uh, Ma Maureen, you've provided um... Um, an interesting snapshot of all of the alternatives that exist um, currently 
um, to, to really change the ways um, investment is done um, from different perspectives. So um, many, thank you for, for this um, quick overview, um, but very comprehensive. Now, um, let me uh, move to the uh, last question and the last uh, uh, panelist. Uh, Mr. Sasha uh, Mueller Kreiner. Um, please, uh, Sasha, um, would you elaborate on this topic? Um, German NGOs recently formulated um, a position paper on finance, financing the transition to sustainability within the EU. Um, what are the, the, the main, the, the key messages of, of this? Um, of these arguments and, and what would be needed to achieve impacts at a larger scale. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Adriana, and uh, thanks also for the organizers, uh, including GSZ, for having me here at this uh, actually really, really timely event. Uh, and uh, the, the the term large scale is exactly what we're talking about. And as uh, Mr. Delgado Rosa also already said, is uh, the EU has put a lot of money on the table to get out of the COVID-19 crisis economically stronger than before and uh, has the ambition, at least in theory, to use the EU Green Deal as the blueprint to do that. And uh, the Green Deal is a programmatic document uh, that covers a lot of ground including uh, the EU biodiversity strategy. And in theory, I think that's a great plan. Now, the money we're talking about is a lot of money. Uh, we're talking about the uh, EU multi-annual framework. So the five-year budget, that is more than a trillion euro. We are talking about an EU recovery package. This is another 700 billion plus we are talking about national recovery packages that are sometimes co-funded by the EU package. So that gets us far beyond 2 billion. And then we are obviously talking about the money that is being leveraged by those investments in the private sector investments that companies that are backed up uh, during that crisis are taking. So we are talking about a lot of money and this money can only be spent once, which is why it has to be spent right. And uh, uh, let me just line out some, some of the principles that we would like to see applied. So when the ambition really is that the Green Deal is the blueprint for those investments, and it should be. Uh, and that would also reflect the commitments the EU has undertaken within the Paris Agreement, within the CBD, in the context of the Sustainable Development Goals. Then we need the following things. The first is we really need specific, quantifiable, and measurable targets for dedicated climate and biodiversity funding. And what we have put on the table is that we want to see at least 30% of the investments dedicated to climate change, including adaptation, and a lot of adaptation, as you know, goes through ecosystems, ecosystem-based adaptation, talking about Europe's, Europe's coasts, Europe's agriculture, Europe's mountainous areas, and at least 10% for biodiversity proper for nature conservation. So this is the first thing. We need those quantifiable targets. And the second thing is, uh, and Mr. Delgado Rosa already mentioned that, we also need the do no harm principle because we're not only talking about those 40%, we also are talking about the rest. And uh, the investments in climate and biodiversity, they make no sense when we invest the, uh, the rest of the money in, in the wrong investments that harm biodiversity. So what does the do no harm uh, principle mean in practice? For example, it means no harmful, uh, no harmful subsidies, no subsidies in the harmful agricultural systems that we have, industrial agriculture that destroys our landscapes, industrial fisheries that destroys our marine spaces, etc., etc. And we probably also need a negative list of projects, a list of projects that cannot be funded in the future. And thirdly, what we need is we need a monitoring system that this doesn't only per remain uh, paper commitments. And there in the EU, we have the taxonomy criteria. Over the last years, we had an expert group that has developed a taxonomy for financial investments. And they are very detailed actually on energy investments. They are a little bit less detailed on anything that has to do with land use, but we have some basis there. And those taxonomy criteria, they were developed for the financing sector should also be uh, used as criteria, uh, as indicators for measuring what we're doing in 
uh, with uh, that uh, that public uh, funding. And uh, uh, I, I will spare you all the detail, but uh, I cannot really close without um, mentioning uh, one uh, uh, current development uh, that uh, makes me a little bit skeptical that everyone has heard the shot. And this has been the recent decision of the European Council of Ministers and the European Parliament on the next phase of the common agriculture policy. 40% of the EU's budget goes into the common agriculture policy. And as everyone here knows around the virtual table, and uh, Mr. Matu has already referred to that, the EU's agricultural policy has effects far beyond the EU on ecosystems far beyond the EU. And uh, through uh, uh, um, uh, supply chains, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and and I must say, when I when I have uh, when I have the principles of the Green Deal in mind, uh, this deal on the common agriculture policy is a disgrace. This kind of industrial agriculture that is perpetuated through still the largest amount of money going to direct payments to industrial agriculture is a crime against biodiversity. It's not, uh, uh, it's not the applications of the principles of the Green Deal. And I think this is the first litmus test, whether the EU really means it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sasha. Um, very, very, very packed, but very um, powerful messages. Um, now, we have a few minutes left uh, for this session, and we thank um, all of the audience for their questions on the WUVA platform. We are going to try to address a few of them um, as much as the time allows, but it, um, for the un unanswered questions, there will be a team of, of people addressing them on the chat um, box later on. So let me start. Um, with a question for uh, Ms. Makulo. Um, there is an interest in, in, in hearing from, from, I mean, from the context in Africa um, in the sense that, um, that it seems that um, there is some, of, some sort of limitation um, regarding budgetary appropriations on financing to tackle environmental challenges. Um, and instead, um, a, a good amount of, of finance flows come from the from international cooperation. Um, would you explain uh, what, in, in the context of your country at least, what is the situation, and um, um, just provide a little bit of context, if you will? Thank you. Uh, in, in a very very uh, short answers, if you if oh, you can. All right. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you very much for your question. In the context of Uganda, yes, we know we, we, we have a lot of money coming from development agencies, uh, but uh, of late government is trying to have domestic financing of its um, budgets and uh, uh, we have a increase in the tax base, which is going to support more domestic financing. And of course, uh, ODA that comes in is just to address the emerging uh, issues that uh, government can uh, not address immediately, but in the long term. So many of the projects that are currently being implemented are being implemented from domestic financing. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Sakulo. Um, Ahora eh, quisiera hacer una pregunta a Rodrigo, por favor, eh, si puede eh, comenzar la traducción. Eh, la pregunta es acerca del rol de los pueblos indígenas eh, en, la, en el diseño de los instrumentos financieros que sean respetuosos a la, a la biodiversidad. ¿Cuál es eh, la... la eh, el rol de los pueblos indígenas para, para, este, para el diseño de esos instrumentos, como se ha escuchado antes de, de otros panelistas. Bueno, eh, bueno la verdad no sería eh, una cuestión que se esté, esté experimentando recientemente 
en cuál pudiera ser el rol de los pueblos indígenas en el diseño de instrumentos de inversión financiera en, en cuanto a biodiversidad. Eh, Quienes hemos seguido estos temas, eh, hemos sido partícipes, inclusive los pueblos indígenas, en la construcción de una directiva voluntaria, la directiva eh, directriz ACUECON. Eh, de la directiva ACUECON para eh, realizar evaluaciones de repercusiones ambientales y sociales en proyectos de desarrollo en territorios indígenas y que tengan repercusiones en sitios y lugares sagrados. Eh, esto es una directriz voluntaria que pudiera ser de, de referencia. Tenemos también, eh, en cuanto a temas de red, las salvaguardas de Cancún, que reconocen los derechos a las tierras y territorios al estándar de los derechos reconocidos a nivel internacional al consentimiento libre, tres informado y con el Banco Mundial hemos eh, sido partícipes los pueblos indígenas en la construcción de las nuevas salvaguardas ambientales y sociales. Entonces, varios de los organismos internacionales, eh, eh, la UNESCO, el CDD, el Banco Mundial tienen construido instrumentos de cómo tratar la relación con pueblos indígenas. Pero, pero ¿cuál debería ser el rol de los pueblos indígenas en, 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 en estos instrumentos internacionales? El rol es de colaboración mutua, de respeto, ¿no es cierto?, hacia los territorios indígenas, a la organización y a las autoridades comunitarias. Creo que eh, eh, Alejandro eh, del, 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 del Perú manifestaba de que el respeto a, los, a las prácticas culturales tradicionales de los pueblos indígenas en función de las nuevas inversiones es, es, es fundamental. Los pueblos indígenas lo que están llamando es efectivamente a invertir ¿no es cierto? en la innovación en la biodiversidad. Entonces, nuestro rol como pueblos indígenas, eh, ahora mismo estoy hablando como delegado del Foro Indígena Internacional sobre Biodiversidad y el Foro Indígena de Aviayala, que es una red global de pueblos indígenas en la región de, de, de América Latina. Entonces, eh, nosotros mismos estamos inmersos en varias iniciativas de colaboración con el Banco Mundial, con la UCN, en función de cómo tratar la relación entre territorios indígenas y áreas protegidas. Entonces, tenemos una colaboración bastante cercana en estos ámbitos y creo que de esas lecciones aprendidas pudiéramos sacar importantes eh, orientaciones y estrategias a definir en la futura relación de eh, las inversiones del sector privado en, en la biodiversidad en territorios indígenas. Un aspecto eh, que me parece importante, los territorios indígenas concentran alrededor del 70% de la biodiversidad terrestre. Entonces, esto, estos son estudios claramente eh, que demuestran de que los recursos de la biodiversidad están en los territorios indígenas. Y los territorios indígenas eh, ofrecen oportunidades de bienes y servicios. Y creo que la inversión financiera debe buscar eh, eh, entrar en los territorios indígenas. Y cómo entrar es eh, eh, a través de una relación, ¿no es cierto?, eh, con parámetros eh, culturalmente apropiados. Se están en, dentro del marco del protocolo de Nagoya, por ejemplo, eh, estableciéndose, desarrollándose protocolos comunitarios de cómo tratar el tema de la relación con los conocimientos tradicionales para el acceso a los recursos genéticos. Entonces, hay varias uh -huh. directrices y orientaciones al respecto que están sobre la mesa y construyéndose de manera conjunta con los pueblos indígenas. Entonces, nosotros okay. llamamos a hacer un esfuerzo conjunto, ¿no es cierto?, paritario, y una relación de diálogo de saberes para eh, los objetivos comunes en cuanto a comprensión de la biodiversidad y uso sostenible de la de estos recursos en función de cumplir con los objetivos de desarrollo de este país. Muchas gracias. Ok, muchísimas gracias, Rodrigo, eh, por esa explicación. Ahora, uh, let's move very quickly, um, actually, a, a question that could be addressed by uh, Dr. Mathur and um, 
uh, Viceministro Quijandria. The question is, uh, what in very specifically, what is the current, um, I mean, the biggest financial incentive for uh, the protection of natural ecosystems? Um, in the case of Peru, for instance, the rainforest uh, and, and the natural ecosystems in, in India. Um, so let's start with Dr. Mathur. What, what is the biggest financial incentive that currently exists to protect natural ecosystems? Survival of self is what I would say. See, the current COVID crisis has made it very clear that if we continue to mess up with the environment, with the nature, it will have its severe black backlash. Today we are talking of COVID-19, but what is the guarantee that there will be no COVID-20, 21, 22, and so on? So see, this is the biggest learning for all that uh, if we continue to mess up with nature, if we continue to deplete our natural capital, it will have severe backlash. And that is something uh, as a kind of a, uh, what should I say, uh, a trade-off is now coming up that uh, these investments are necessary. And uh, as we heard, I again repeat the report that financial uh, institutions are lending their money, which goes to harm biodiversity. And I also want to recall the report of the World Economic Forum last year, which said that environment and biodiversity losses are among the top five risks to business. So see, these are the kind of things where, which people are now able to uh, see the connect, that there is a very important connect. And uh, we have talked about, and we are talking about One Health and that is where we need all our investments to be, whether we are talking of a public health or whether we are talking of human health or a wild animal health. We need to integrate all these uh, uh, different health that we are talking. And I would also like to uh, add one more to it, which is the soil health. See, if uh, the soil health uh, gets disturbed, then neither the agriculture productivity can happen nor the forest productivity can happen. So see, these are the learnings uh, of uh, 2020 that we need to take a holistic view and we need to work out our mechanisms and we need to find out and tweak our existing financial schemes. And especially I would say the public sector. See, the private sector can also help but the scope of private sector is far limited than what uh, the public finance is there. And especially in developing countries, it is the government which has to see that uh, how their policies can be aligned for supporting and securing conservation. So I'll stop here and thank you very much uh, for uh, giving this opportunity one more time. Thank you, Dr. Bathor. Uh, uh, Viceministro Quijandria, en un minuto, que de otro modo nos cortan. Adelante. Muchas gracias, Adriana. Yo creo, yo creo y vuelvo, vuelvo a un tema que había tocado en una, en una participación anterior, creo que el tema de innovación y de nuevos modelos de negocio es lo que está permitiendo este, tener negocios que son más inmunes a la situación que se ha generado por el COVID, por ejemplo. En el ámbito amazónico hemos visto que negocios fuertemente dependientes, por ejemplo, de inversiones en grandes carreteras o en grandes infraestructuras, como lo señalaba Sasha, por ejemplo, cuando hablaba sobre el tema de la agricultura industrial, este, han demostrado que están menos capacitados para recuperarse en, un, en, en, un, en, en el escenario posterior a la pandemia. Y los emprendimientos que, están, que tienen una lógica más de sostenibilidad, que son, como digo, menos dependientes de una inversión grande o de una transformación grande del espacio, este, que, son, que, que están más avanzados en términos de utilización de tecnologías digitales, o sea, que están más en, 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 en digamos, en la onda moderna, eh, son los que van a poder salir fortalecidos incluso de, de la situación en la, en la que estamos. O sea, con, con, con toda esta situación 
de distanciamiento social, el, el, la, la, la gran, la gran este, presión que hay por el delivery, por la utilización de nuevos, este, mega, o sea, nue nuevos sistemas, por ejemplo, de empaque y todo eso, creo que aquellas iniciativas que están incorporando de manera integral la mirada verde son las que van a ser exitosas en el largo plazo, son las que van a poder pagar sus préstamos en última instancia al sector financiero. Y creo que por ahí es donde está viniendo la señal, la señal más clara. Excelente. Eh, muchísimas gracias, viceministro. Um, uh, G uh, GLF has granted us uh, five more minutes or less, but I don't want to risk it. Um, I apologize to, uh, to the private sector um, panelists because there are questions for you, but um, unfortunately time is up. So we have to leave them for the chat box. Um, and of course, you're more than welcome to, to address these questions later on. Um, I just wanted to share with the audience uh, because I think that um, it is, um, there has been a lot of uh, important things said in this session. Just wanted to share a few key messages um, as we wrap up. First, investing in biodiversity means to invest into a sustainable future, into a public good important like it, um, such a, as important as education or health. Economic development relies on biodiversity and ecosystem services. Sustainable production will, should and will, will turn into the norm. Uh, second, we need adequate governance structures and leadership for integration of biodiversity. Avoiding pandemics in the future need uh, to give more space to nature. The principle of do not Uh, harm or do no harm should be applied in recovery and stimulus programs. We have to rethink subsidies, employment schemes, and infrastructure in favor of nature. Third, um, indigenous people should be included in, this, in decision making on investment and the design of development funds because of the, their traditional knowledge on biodiversity. Give priority to invest Um, related to future biodiversity within recovery programs. Um, and finally, the finance sector uh, was, was late in realizing the importance of biodiversity. Financial impacts and risks are still not well captured. Biodiversity must uh, be um, um, valued as an asset and should be framed in the, uh, included in the financial world. Um, qualify the risks of biodiversity loss and quantify the returns by evaluating biodiversity. Um, a monitoring system is needed. Um, and the one last comment, I think, coming from the questions is that the EU common agricultural policy um, critically needs to, to align with these principles of uh, protecting biodiversity. So, um, Again, um, with this, I, I wrap up the session. Uh, thank you very much again to all of the panelists for such an interesting insights uh, from your experience and, and knowledge. Um, we hope that this session was useful for, uh, for all of the participants. Um, it, it, is, it was certainly uh, really useful for me. Um, so let's continue on this, on this work um, and hopefully We will see one health, one future um, materializing in the near term future. Goodbye.